So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Julie Merino Carella. I am a program coordinator here uh, for events and women in energy for uh, the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia University. Um, I will introduce the Women in Energy program momentarily. Let me first quickly say that this event, like all of the center's events, is being webcast live and the full video will be available on our website in the coming days. For those watching online as well as uh, people here in the audience, you can ask your questions for the panelists at any time using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Uh, so the Women in Energy program is geared towards female graduate students interested in working in the energy space. Uh, the program aims to increase the presence of women in the energy sector, and over the mid to long term, the presence of senior uh, and management, uh, the number of women in senior management roles across the energy space. And we do that through a variety of public outreach, networking, community building activities, leadership training and mentorship, and facilitating opportunities for paid internships and full-time employment. Um, so I actually met Teresa at a Women in Energy event, and she mentioned that she volunteers for Green Home NYC, and we both realized that there's definitely collaboration opportunities. So um, we're pretty excited to be partnering um, in this uh, particular program, which is going to feature um, eight female experts navigating the green universe. And I wanted to say that this is just one of the... Uh, great numbers of events that we have coming up in the coming weeks. Um, and next week, we're having a student-only Women in Energy lunch with the uh, director of the board for Renew Power. Her name is uh, Vaisheli uh, Sina. We're also having a larger public event on November 1st, uh, which uh, will focus on where next on climate, the future of international climate negotiations. That's going to feature uh, Suzanne Baez, who is uh, the US climate lawyer who negotiated the Paris Agreement, um, and Daniel Riffsnyder, who was the co-chair for the Paris Agreement negotiations. And the following Women in Energy public event they were having will be at Rutgers University. I should have also mentioned that the Women in Energy uh, program is not just for Columbia students. It's uh, cutting across all universities. We work with NYU, the new school, and are having our first Rutgers event um, on November 8th, and we're pretty excited about that. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Teresa to introduce Green Home. Uh, thanks, Julie. I want to just welcome everyone today to the Women of Green Monthly Forum. My name is Teresa Baker. Um, I'm the lead volunteer for the Green Home NYC Monthly Forums program. And I've been volunteering with Green Home NYC for about four years now. Um, so this, this is actually our fourth time doing this event, so I'll get into that. <laughs> um, so this, is, this evening's event is also, like you said, being co-hosted by um, the Center of Global Energy Policies, Women in Energy Program, and I want to thank Julie and the group for um, bringing the Women in Energy Group into this uh, evening's event and for giving us access to this wonderful space. Um, so a little bit about Green Home NYC. So we're an all-volunteer nonprofit that promotes sustainability and energy efficiency in the built environment, as well as supporting green professional development in the greater New York City area. Uh, and we host three... Oh, so back, sorry. We host uh, three different types of programs, so I'll just go into them really quickly. The monthly forums, which is part of this program tonight, they're held on the third Wednesday of every month. Um, the last event of the year is actually this November, and uh, it's going to be on transportation. And you can find all this information on our website, greenhomenyc.org. And if you have any questions about our events, you can email the forums group at forums at greenhomenyc.org. Uh, we also have Green Career Transitions. Uh, they are events that provide informational resources and networking opportunities for those that are looking to break into the uh, green space or further their career. Uh, and they're held on the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, and I think they're doing a little bit more planning for next year right now. So events are going to be kicking off in January. And if you're interested in getting involved or attending their events, you can email them there. Uh, and we also do green building tours. And they're held about every other month. Uh, there's actually one coming up next week, and it's on the Newtown Creek wa Wastewater Treatment Plant in Brooklyn. Uh, I think the event's sold out, but if you want to get in, you can uh, email the TORS group and see if there's a wait list to get in. Uh, so tonight's event, uh, the Women of Green. So um, we're really excited to bring back the Women of Green Forum. 
This is our fourth time that Green Home NYC has organized this session. The first one was seven and a half years ago uh, in cooperation with Hunter College, and then six and a half years ago with Nessie, and four years ago with Con Edison. So uh, clearly it's been too long, so we're bringing this back and uh, in coordination with the Women in Energy program, which is a great co-sponsor to have for this kind of event. <laughs> um, we wanted to put this event together to highlight both the accomplishments and the pleasure it is to work with uh, these women who are strong, confident, and dedicated to their work, and a lot of them actually have ties to the Green Home NYC group, so I'm hoping that they'll talk a little bit about it as well tonight. <laughs> um, so just again about this forum tonight, uh, it's done a little bit differently than our normal forums, which this is a Pecha Kucha forum. So these will be all timed slides um, with one slide in between for a short uh, applause and for the next speaker to come up and introduce themselves. So because there's going to be quick transitions, uh, we're going to save all the questions until the end of the uh, last slide and then uh, we'll bring all the speakers up for questions. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, if you want to get involved, like I said, greenhomenyc.org, you can get in contact with us. Um, if there are any Green Home NYC volunteers here tonight, I'd like you to raise your hand. So you can also come to any one of these people that are raising their hand and talk to them about how to get involved. Um, and most importantly, uh, after the forum, we host a little bit of networking and um, getting together and talking about stuff. So we'll be holding that tonight at the Arts and Crafts Beer Parlor. It's on the corner of 116th in Amsterdam. So like you can see, it's pretty much right around the corner. Um, and we'll be going there after this is all over. Um, so I think I've hit all the points. So <laughs> with that, uh, we'll get things started. I have to figure out how to change the slides. Um, and we'll bring up our first speaker, which will be Lucy Dupas. OK. Um, my name is Lucy Dupa. I'm the engineering director for EnterSolar. I'm also the vice president of the board of Green Home MNYC. And I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, I actually rehearsed starting with my first slide, which is going to be coming up very soon here, and then we can talk about it. Um, and so my first slide is this one. I want to talk to you tonight about how to find your professional heaven, which I think is at the intersection of what you're good at, what you care about, and what you enjoy doing. As I said, I'm an engineer. I studied engineering with a bunch of nerds. And you know how that that started? That started because my parents were nerds. They were both IT engineers, as you can see here, kind of, maybe. Um, and so I grew up in a household of engineers. There was no reason for me to think that engineering wasn't going to be my life. And so that's, that's how I started. Um, I studied a five-year master's degree program in France at uh, one of the goodish engineering schools, I guess. And the great thing about it is that 42% of students in that school are women, which is actually amazing, I think, compared to most engineering schools in the world. Um, it made me you know, feel like being a woman engineer was the normal thing to do. And now it just surprises me when people say, oh, you're a woman and you're an engineer? I'm, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so what happened during that, that uh, education is that someone challenged me to find my dream internship. I said, you know what? I want to do wind in New York City. Everyone looked at me like I was completely crazy. So I started calling all of these small companies that did renewables. And I found a company that literally had no money but was interested in taking me as their unpaid intern for three months. So I did that. Um, I was actually an au pair at the same time. And, um, and I built my first solar system. It had an awesome, like probably 500 watt wind turbine on top of it. And it has a tiny little storage system in the back. So that powered like one plug in this gigantic industrial building. Um, and the great thing about that internship is that it was in um, the NYU Poly Acre incubator. So I was with a bunch of amazing startups. I, I learned a lot about how startups work, what they do, the struggles, the challenges that they go through. And it taught me a lot about networking and, um, and just you know how to work in a small company. So after I graduated from school, I went to work for a small startup that those same people liked me enough to give me a job. Um, and there I did all the things that you, you think an engineer does. 
I, des I did a 3D design of this part. I tested it in a laboratory. I worked with manufacturers. I trained some 200 pound electricians, even though I couldn't even carry one of those panels and I had you know, been on a roof for tw you know, two or three times in my life. I went around and they trusted me and that was, that was a great experience because these guys didn't know how to do it and they were listening to me and I had been working for like six months. So, so that was great. Um, and so I, I did that for a couple years, and then I went to work for uh, Bright Power, um, which is, which used to be a small company and now is much bigger. The uh, Andrew is going to tell you all about it, but this was one of the projects that I worked on. It was solar for new construction for affordable housing. I learned to work with architects, with engineering firms. I learned about permitting. I did um, this cool, you know, photo shoot on a roof uh, where I. <laughs> I actually managed the installation of a solar thermal system, one of the few that are in the city right now. Um, and I learned about a bunch of other technologies and commissioning and energy efficiency, and that gave me a really good broad understanding of the industry. industry. Also, I met this guy at a conference. <laughs> um, that was, you know, you go to these conferences and, and you learn these random things, and you also just meet a lot of people, and he was a sponsor. Uh, for one of the module manufacturers. So, you know, hung out with that guy. Thanks, Bright Power, for that. Um, but after doing that for two years, I ended up um, applying for a job with EnterSolar, which is a, ni a nationwide uh, solar installer, um, which does commercial projects, so much larger than what I was doing at Bright Power, and now only focusing on the solar PV technology. Um, so it was a pretty different job because instead of working with all these other firms and all these technologies, I was focusing on only one thing, solar PV. But I was also learning about all the different aspects of a project. Like this is a project in upstate New York where I learned about per permitting, wetlands, civil engineering, um, negotiations with utilities, negotiations with this customer right there. Uh, we're also working on a very challenging project right now in Roosevelt Island on uh, the Cornell Tech um, campus where we're integrating solar panels into the structure of the roof. So um, this job was still an engineering job, but not a design job, not a uh, job where I had to know all these different technologies. It's very specific to solar. Um, and one thing that you know really excited me about this job is that I got all this training on a particular technology, and um, and Enersolar was really open to training, and I really appreciated that. Um, I was able to maybe of the slide moves. I was able to get my NAPSEP certification, which is a um, a um, recognized certification in the industry, and um, I don't know what's going on with the size right now, and um, you know that really helped with confidence. Um, <laughs> I'm really confident right now. Um, so I really wanted to touch on training and and just everyone. You know how you think you know something, but when you go through a certification, you realize there's so much stuff that you don't really know. And then having the name on your resume is just so useful to just show yourself as an expert in the industry. So um, one thing that you know I really think everyone should be pushing for is training. Um, and then the next thing that I, I want to touch on really quickly is that sometimes as women we forget that we have to say the things that we think. We just think that other people are just going to, you know, interpret or look or what we think or the fact that we don't look very happy every day. Um, I want to say a story that happened to me at a conference recently where one of my vendors told me to calm down and that I was acting like a two-year-old and then turned around to my male colleague. What? How does that happen? This is the 21st century. He's my vendor. I, I looked around. I told him, that's pretty misogynistic what you just said. Everyone was so uncomfortable. But I was so glad that I did it. And the reason why I was able to say it is because I was confident from my past experience. And like, what nice track? Who thinks that this is an appropriate way to market a solar mounting system? Like, how does this still happen in the 21st century? You'd think that solar is so progressive. Anyway, so um, I know that I cared about renewables. I, know, I knew that I was a good engineer. 
And what I realized throughout these last seven years is that I really enjoy training people and managing people. So after saying that in 12 different ways, in 15 different occasions, I ended up being able to manage my own team of engineers. You can see them on this picture. They're all amazing people. And that's how I found my professional heaven. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sharon Gaber, and I'm currently the manager of the North American Passive House Network. Um, I'll be speaking today about the diverse path that I took to work in the sustainability field. When asked to speak, uh, I took a glance at the other speakers, and I'm going to guess that I'm probably the only person here with a BA and an MA um, in the arts. So as you can see, my path is not a straightforward one. And you know what? That was that slide. So. I'm just going to continue. <laughs> that was that slide, so I'm just going to like wave for 20 seconds. <laughs> OK. And one thing I'd like to add is I just took a training. I took the Certified Passive House Designer training. And I totally agree, training is awesome. So if you're going to do something, become an expert in the field by doing that. OK, 20 seconds has to be up by now. Is this working? I'm just going to go. OK, so I've learned throughout the years that it's not only important to follow your passions and your interests, but it's integral to having success in your chosen field. As I mentioned, I have a background in art history, and I've always loved spending time in nature and uh, doing all kinds of different activities outside. And I've always been intrigued and inspired by sustainable design, anything from energy efficiency, green roofs, to biophilic design. I don't know if this is working. Is it? Oh, I don't think it is. OK, so here's a quick run through of my education and my current credentials. I've always been keen on education and uh, learning new subjects and skills and seeing how they all can intersect. I started out with a BA in art history. Um, and I have an MA in museum studies for decorative art. So that basically is furniture, glassware, ceramics, design. And then I turned my attention to sustainable design so I have a common theme here, and it's all about buildings, whether it's interiors or exteriors. I'm also a licensed real estate agent, again, buildings. <laughs> so after graduate school, I got the opportunity to work in Perugia, Italy, um, at a historic house foundation with a colleague from FIT. I knew I needed additional employment, so before I left, I became a certified ESL teacher um, to get a teaching position while I was there. Um, I had already found that I enjoyed teaching while I was a TA at the New York School of Interior Design, so I put these skills to use, and I found my love of teaching, and uh, working with students came naturally. Do you want to fix this, Andy? Okay. Everyone has a turning point which lays out their path. After returning from Italy, I worked as an assistant manager for the high-end luxury antique trade showroom. I liaised with noteworthy uh, interior designers and architects. And every single time I was working at installations in newly renovated spaces, I saw so much building waste. And I thought, that, can't this be reused? And it was a light bulb. It was a light bulb. And I thought, can we lessen this or reuse it? So I decided I wanted to be an active participant and I did a bunch of research, and through Green Building, I actually found Green Home NYC. So I contacted Green Home, and I started to work on small projects here and there, but I really wanted to get involved and to, you know, to learn and to educate. And at the time, they needed someone to coordinate their educational forms, much like this, exactly like this, actually. And I jumped at the opportunity. And it's forever changed my career path and my life. And I felt like I'd find two passions at once. I loved the green building aspect, but also thrived in coordination and planning of all the forums. And there was a constant exchange of new ideas and everybody I interacted with. So as I began to network and meet new people in the industry, I fell to an opportunity that satisfied both my uh, antiques and my green buildings that remains lighting. And I was hired to be an antiques registrar and a project, a lead project manager for their new uh, renovated warehouse. It, uh, the owner of the company was very sustainably minded. And at this position, I actually got the chance to become a lead AP. I'm going to probably 
guess that most of us as a panel might have been involved in some kind of economic downturn. In 2008, when the market crashed, I was actually laid off from my job, and the lead project was put on hold. So at this point, um, I understood that the luxury design industry can be a little bit of a volatile one. So I figured I could either find a new job I didn't really want, or I could figure out how to create something of my own. So I did. So I started with extra time I had on my hands, and I used it to figure out the best way to start my business. I researched ways to bootstrap, and I found an amazing free program through the small business services called Fast Track New Venture. I did the six-week program, and by the end of the program, I founded my own sustainability consultancy called Cloverleaf Energy and Environmental Design. Um, now I thought, great, now what? I need clients. <laughs> so after some struggles, I received some friendly advice and much needed at the time as to what niche I should focus on. And that was to combine passion of art and sustainability, to reach out to help museums to become more energy efficient and overall more green. And this step opened up a whole new field for me and it jump started by um, an opportunity I had at Nessie. So I was given the opportunity to create and coordinate and moderate a workshop at Nessie called Build, um, uh, the Build the Energy Conference in Boston uh, called Greening Museums and Cultural Institutions. And I was back doing what I really loved, disseminating the message, finding expert speakers, curating content, organizing, and moderating. OK, this is going fast. OK. <laughs> Here I am. So I had switched at that time from volunteering at Green Home NYC to going to the American Alliance Museums with their professional sustainability group called Pit Green. We have a small but tight-knit group, and we have a yearly conference where we do a sustainability session track, we do a sustainability excellence awards, and we also do local field trips. And it was here last year at the AAM um, from Pit Green. We gave the Exploratorium in San Francisco uh, an award for facilities and site operations, their net zero building. And it was come full circle because just two weeks ago I got to visit there and with my present job. So it shows when you do what you love, you can figure it out. So I want to take a little bit of time to address something I find important. And this is the generalist versus the specialist. A lot of different things. Um, I was always a generalist. I never really knew, I knew one thing, but nothing when, not one subject really well. So I feel like with the generalist, you have a broad knowledge. Expert, a little bit deeper. Generalist, you're not afraid of the kind of step out of your comfort zone. Expert in your own field. You rely on aptitude, experience, and out of the box thinking versus problem solving ability. You know, which one is better? Which do you feel it speaks to you? And this is where kind of lessons learned come into play. And I strongly believe that in order to be successful, happy, and prepared, you need to have a crossover of both, something like the expert generalist. To me, this was the best of both worlds. Instead of just being an expert in one area, you're almost an expert in two to three. And this way, you're working in your life, and you're always prepared to fall back on something. So now, I, in the present day, I currently split my time between my consultancy and managing the North American Passive House Network. At the NAPHN, I manage a nationwide certified Passive House design courses, and I use my wide array of business and sales skills to build our Passive House organization from the ground up. And I finally have a, be part of a flourishing green building community that is a huge potential for growth and to build something with a solid foundation. Uh, I was recently in Oakland for the NAPHN's annual conference, Passive and Renewables, and we had Amina J. Mohammed, the Deputy, Director, Deputy Secretary General of the UN, speak via video, and we had Scott Forrester, the Director of the Sustainable Energy Division of the UN Economic Commission for Europe, total mouthful, to attend in person to show both the UN's commitment and effort on supporting sustainable design. And moving lastly, I would like to say that it's supposed to say walk the talk, not walk to talk. Um, sorry. Um, that <laughs> I think when you're in the sustainability field, you feel like you, you need to do it in each area. And I have, me and my husband have actually been vegan for almost a year. Uh, I'm dairy free and meat free. He's actually been more. <laughs> so congrats to him. I'm getting there. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and a huge thank you to Green Home and to Andy for asking me to speak and this opportunities that Green Home has afforded me throughout the years. I owe a great deal to this organization. And um, I can be reached at Clee.clo, my blog, at Green Museum's Twitter, and Sharon at NAPHN Network.
Hi, uh, that's me. I'm Alison Kling. Um, I'm a project specialist at Con Edison. One of my favorite classes in college was named Chocolate Milkshake. This was not a class about ice cream. It was a nickname for a seminar called Chaucer, Milton, and Shakespeare. The teacher was amazing. We read body English tales, epic poems, and we struggled through iambic pentameter. So 20 years later, I'm working at a utility and talking to you about my career in energy. How does one get from a literary studies degree at a small liberal arts school to here? Like most careers um, these days, it's not a linear path. Um, the spaghetti roadside, roadside slide might be a little of an exaggeration, but it's close. So when I graduated college, I tried to hang on to my literary roots by working in publishing in New York City. I got a lot of free books and hung out with cool authors, but it wasn't for me. The idea of public service, environmentalism appealed, but I had zero experience. So I went to the time-honored tradition of going to grad school to force a career change. I was about to graduate with a master's in urban planning. I had loans, and I was getting nervous about a job. I was interested in a lot of things, green building, energy, transportation. Time and finances helped me make my decision. I heard about an opening in the city, and I interviewed well enough to get the job. The Economic Development Corporation was the home of the city's energy policy group at that time, and I was coming in very cold. I took all the grunt work, and I asked a lot of questions. Uh, there were several senior women in my department who were incredibly supportive. Uh, one of them actually gave me some renewable energy projects to cover while she was on maternity leave. So for four years, I kept asking questions, and I worked really hard. I started understanding enough to know what areas were actually interesting to me, and I had figured out that solar was the most exciting part of the job. A position opened up at CUNY, who was a partner with EDC on solar programs, and I was able to take what I had learned and get the job. This job really narrowed my focus. I was able to dive deep into a single area and learn from local and national experts. I learned about permitting, interconnection, solar mapping, policy, zoning, fire codes, you name it. I also had the chance to develop a lot of relationships. My next move, very unexpected. The manager of Con Edison's distributed generation team was looking for someone with a solar background. I wasn't sure if it'd be the right move. Would it be a bunch of stodgy engineers or would it be exciting? I had a lot of respect for the woman who was recruiting me, so I decided I couldn't pass it up. That was in 2013. I have not looked back. Um, I was able to bring my solar expertise and build it up with knowledge about the physical infrastructure that serves this city. It's been an incredible learning experience. This is a one minute data dump of the things I have either learned about or I could walk down the hall and find an expert in. Um, so it's been a pretty amazing experience. My first job was to help solar customers and developers with their projects, um, like Lucy, um, improve internal procedures, coordinate policy with regulators and other utilities. Um, just very recently, my new project will build solar on Con Edison rooftops and use the power to benefit low-income customers. So milkshakes, utility, awesome job in three minutes. <laughs> um, each step has started off with a slightly terrifying leap of faith. I've learned from each move, both about the work and how to develop as a professional. Um, and I've been able to move on when the learning curve starts to flatten up there at the top. Let's take a step. Let's not forget that the most important stuff happens outside of work. In these years, I did a lot of other things. I played lots of ultimate frisbee. I fell in love. I traveled. I kept a group of friends. I got married. I had two kids. My life outside of work has been able to prioritize what's important. Now that I'm older and wiser, if I had a time machine like Brian and Stewie up there, what would I go back and tell my 21-year-old self? Honestly, I wouldn't want much to change. I'm pretty happy with how my life has turned out, and learning, is really the on learning by doing is really the only way to go. But I'll try to put together some advice that might help others. Um, your professional world would be a very small place. Um, people move around. Your peers will move up, over, sideways. That smart intern you just hired might be a VP in 20 years. Every single job I got came through hard work and networking. So be professional, support good people, and be civil. Um, <laughs> so learn how to do the work. Parts of your job will be really boring, but they might be the parts that actually get stuff done. 
Get to know your operational details. Work to get a practical result. Don't just work to show off that you're working. Triage what needs to happen today to hit your deadline next week and learn how to organize your stuff. <laughs> Um, talk to people. It's easy to read an article. It's easy to attend a webinar. It's hard to pick up the phone, swing by someone's desk, get them out for coffee, especially if you don't know them. But do it. News articles get real details and nuances very wrong a lot, and you're only going to learn by talking to people. Women. When you do go talk to people, especially as a woman, they might say dumb or offensive things to you. Earlier on in my career, I was at an event, and an older gentleman described me and my female coworkers as energy bunnies. <laughs> what kind of bunnies he was talking about, I don't know. I don't really want a picture. Um, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> so years later, it's an amusing anecdote, and it wasn't nice to hear at the time. Luckily, the places I've worked have been filled with actual grown-ups who are fair and respectful. But I still hear men referring to their female colleagues as girls, or I hear someone tell me it's nice I have daughters because they can help with the cooking and cleaning. Mm -hmm. The point is, for little or big stuff, decide for yourself what your reaction's going to be. Sometimes you roll your eyes. Sometimes you get angry. Sometimes you call someone out and tell them that what they just said was misogynistic. Um, if it makes you uncomfortable or if it's holding you back, call HR. And if you don't get support, you're probably working in the wrong place. This is my happy place ending slide of Michelle Obama. <laughs> Find the good people, surround yourself with them. My career would be impossible without the intelligent, curious, hilarious, and strong women and men that I have as colleagues and friends. Get in a department with a good manager who respects you and have fun, because work isn't everything. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Mancino. I am the manager of new construction. I was actually just promoted to director recently. That hasn't been announced to my company yet. Um, Bright Power is an energy management firm that specializes in everything from design, um, consulting, solar, utility benchmarking, um, and uh, multifamily energy and sustainability services. Uh, before Bright Power, I was actually, oh, and I like to take, take selfies on site. Um, <laughs> Before Bright Power, I was a res residential energy auditor, uh, which just kind of sounded good to me after doing some research online. Um, and at Bright Power, I started as a existing buildings intern and worked my way all the way up to where I am now, uh, five years later. Um, but my big break came when I was volunteering at a Garrison Institute symposium, trying to figure out how to get into the industry. And I bumped into two people uh, who, um, Andy Padian and Bomi Jung, who told me about Green Home NYC and the opportunities in New York. So once I got back to New York, I followed up with Andy and got involved with Green Home NYC. And um, this Women in Green event was actually the first event I attended as an emerging professional. So I remember looking up to the women and being really happy about it. So it's really nice to be here and have come full circle. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I, I got a referral for a, a, an interview at Bright Power, and um, I got through the door, and I am, uh, and I nailed it, and that's why I'm here. Um, so. When I first started at Bright Power, uh, it was still sm a very small startup, and on there were only three women in the engineering group, one, uh, one of which is here, Lucy and myself. And we also used to sub out the new construction service to an outside firm, uh, which is important uh, for later. Um, now we have over 100 employees, and we have pretty much half and half uh, women and men on the engineering group in particular, which really makes me happy. And it's great to see a shift of women in more leadership roles within the company. Um, when I was on the existing buildings group, my colleague, Sky Gruen, came to me and said, hey, I'm going to bring new construction in-house. Do you want to come on and be a project manager? And I was like, hell yeah. It sounded like a good opportunity. And the new construction group was born for bright power, uh, just us two. And um, now, today, we have 12 employees. We're growing uh, pretty exponentially. And we have a whole bunch of different services that we do in-house now. Um, we're still adjusting to industry needs and client needs and uh, really happy to kind of see you know, where we're coming, um, having just been the two of us. 
So uh, when I was doing project management work, and I still kind of do, um, I worked on everything from rehabs to high-level new construction projects, uh, doing design consulting, construction, te construction testing and verification, uh, certifications. And so it really requires you to be a jack of all trades. You have to know everything from ventilation flow rates to lighting fixture controls to HVAC to insulation strategies. And so it's been really important to stay on top of the latest technology trends. Um, being in the field is my favorite part of the job, and I think that you could really learn a ton by getting your hands dirty, and it's worth noting that just because something is designed really well on paper doesn't mean that it's going to be constructed that exact way. So um, kind of taking what you learn in the field and using it for your design consulting uh, is a really good circle to be in. Um, I'm usually one of the only women on construction sites. Maybe there are two or three of us on a good day. Uh, and my experience has been positive overall, but let's just face it, I stick out like a sore thumb. And so uh, I've, I've had people give me the side eye. Men give me the side eye, like who the hell is this woman telling me what to do? Um, but I would say the, the worst moment was when a contractor wouldn't shake my hand and was like rolling his eyes at me, ignoring me completely, um, kind of going, ugh, whenever I'd speak and talking to the man next to me. Uh, and so I stayed quiet, you know, because I, I knew my worth. And uh, basically, after going through a really, really tough problem on site and uh, walking them through it and helping them come up with a strategy, I got his respect. And he suddenly loosened up and was smiling at me, um, shaked my hand at the end. And we've been working together ever since. But the lesson learned is that I had to prove myself uh, twice as hard as everyone else in the room to get the respect of the people around me. And uh, I wouldn't be honest with you all if I didn't say that I get called honey, sweetheart, babe, uh, cutie uh, on site pretty pretty often, and I think that um, I'm still learning how to deal with it. I've dealt with it by either staying quiet, uh, you know, brushing it off, t sticking up for myself, or being like, "Hey, love bug," back at someone. <laughs> Um, but overall, these are rare occurrences, and my experience has been really pleasant, and being a woman on a construction site actually has a lot of uh, perks and can be used to your advantage if you know how to use it right um, in no you know, sexual way. Um, so I've seen a shift in the industry towards more women representation for sure, and particularly it's been in the engineering component of my job, uh, but the construction industry still needs work. Um, women don't hold construction site super uh, um, jobs or any kind of major uh, powerful jobs in the actual construction industry, and I'd like to change that. So my advice for for emerging professionals is to um, definitely stay in school, uh, but get your hands dirty, go out on site, find someone that um, will mentor you. And there's a lot that you can learn in school, but there's also a lot in this industry that you can't learn, um, that you have to learn by experience. Uh, networking is also a really big thing. It's helped me a lot, but if you're gonna try to have someone kind of, you know, connect you to a job, you want to make sure that you're not getting, you know, they're not going to get the job for you. You want to make your own mark. You want to make sure that you get through the door, but you make a name for yourself. Uh, and attending industry events is also important. And then advice for women in particular, growth, thick skin, and, you know, but know when the line is crossed and know when to stick up for yourself. And um, mentoring, supporting, and advocating for each other is also really important. And I, I'm part of Women in Construction, empowered by Procore, which is a really great advocacy group. So I suggest doing that. And then finally, someone once told me that uh, you have to fertilize the fields behind you. And um, you know, I think that this means stay humble, remember your journey, and pass on your experiences to others coming into the field behind you to ensure success in the industry and the people within it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jackie Ottman, and I wanted to uh, start by thanking Ashley Felix for inviting me tonight. She was an intern of mine. I invited her to events, so now she's inviting me to some events. Um, tonight, I'm going to share my personal sustainability journey, as well as a very simple tool for helping you to define your own journey and place in the universe. My journey revolves around finding treasures in the trash, something I've been doing since I was four years old. Though, as you'll see, it took me a little while to figure it out. If you can't see me behind here, by the way, that's what I look like. 
Um, I didn't realize I was a dumpster diver when I went to college because I studied Rembrandt and Vermeer, but I learned I was a visual learner. I learned to think, I learned to write, I went to a women's college, and I became inspired by the successes and passions of other women. I still didn't realize I was a dumpster diver when I got my first job. I went into advertising and I sold deodorant and potato chips. But I did learn how to sell things to millions of people using the power of images and in 28 seconds or less. But I realized there was more than just potato chips and deodorant out there. How did I find how to find out what that was? So one day in 1989, I wrote down all the things I really wanted to do. I wanted to analyze trends. I wanted to introduce new products. I wanted to do something with the environment, but I wasn't sure what. I wanted to teach. I wanted to write. So I figured out I could become a green marketing consultant. I spent the next 25 years advising a lot of companies about how to market green products. In case you're wondering, I was largely self-taught. My secret, in the valley of the blind, the one-eyed man or woman is king. Whatever I didn't know, I just figured out. During that time, I wrote down everything I learned in five books. I spoke to audiences all over the world. But at the end of 25 years, I decided I wanted to help the world reduce waste. But what would that look like? Breath while we're waiting for the slides to turn. So I went back to that piece of paper and I updated it to reflect all the skills and expertise I now wanted to use. I decided to change my job title to Waste Reduction Catalyst. I would do this by telling stories online. So I founded a website called wehatetowaste.com. That's what the front page looks like. I invited people from all over the world to share their stories about what they do to reduce waste. I'm trying to answer one question. What does a resource efficient lifestyle that people actually want to live look like? I've decided there are five answers to that question and it revolves around not shopping. It revolves around sharing, swapping, borrowing and lending, donating and gifting things to each other. Sounds a lot more fun than shopping, right? And in the past couple of years, I tweaked what I do. In 2015, New York City introduced a zero waste plan. So I decided to focus on changing consumption culture right here in New York City. So I primarily try to spread the word about what is possible to do here. I am a New York City zero waste influencer. So I've joined the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. I testify in front of city council. And this past summer, I was invited to Denmark to learn about their circular economy. So I recently gave a presentation about what we here in the US can learn from the Danes. So enough about me. Let's talk about you. How can you define your own place in the universe? Why not start to use the same little tool I vented for myself? It starts with the assumption that your dream job reflects that one place in the universe that reflects all the intersecting lines that define you. You start by drawing a big fat dot in the middle of a page, and then you label all the intersecting lines with the lines of the things that you like to do, that you do well, that you like to do, even where you might like to do it or how you like to work. Do you want to be the boss or the brains behind the operation? Do you want to be in New York or someplace else. Then you look for the different jobs that represent the intersection of three of those lines. A former assistant of mine decided she didn't want to work for me. She'd really want, rather pursue a job at communications director for a not-for-profit that focused on the oceans. In fact, when she went home that night and Googled that, she found a job that was open in California. Another gal came to me and said she liked acting, loved to babysit, and liked to teach. So we decided she should be an after-school drama coach. I think you see how this works. So I'm going to leave you with four words of advice. The first is to be you. Each of us has something very special to offer. We just have to find out what that is. Like I did, look to your past, even the things that people would kid you about. When I was four, my brother and sister called me Junkie Jackie. 
make your environmental passion relevant. When I decided to become a green marketing consultant, people were starting to look for greener products to buy. So I said, why not use the skills I learned on Madison Avenue to sell those kinds of products to people? So what might be relevant today? Climate change, environmental justice? Think in threes. I always remind people that they just can't be an environmentalist. They have to be an environmental something, an environmental lawyer, an environmental advocate. But it's better to be three things than two things. How about an environmental lawyer with, that deals with justice issues? That sounds pretty good. And finally, be prepared to pivot. The world keeps changing. We need to keep updating and learning new skills. We need to keep track of what are the most pressing needs facing society today, so, and we can then see how we can use our skills to address those, those uh, needs of today. So thanks very much for listening. I hope this is all, even if you can't see me, <laughs> I hope this has been helpful to you, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions. I hope you hate waste as much as we do up at We Hate to Waste, and I have a Twitter, We Hate to Waste, and Jacqueline Ottman. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Schwamm. I am a senior sustainability consultant with Stephen Winter Associates. I'm also a Green Home NYC volunteer, uh, and I'm also very excited to be on this panel of women. Um, just to provide a little bit of uh, framework for my discussion, um, I find it's really compelling to hear about people's trajectories, the way that they got uh, from point A to point B, so I'm going to focus a bit on that. Um, and because I have a particular affinity for the Green Home NYC <clears throat> Green Careers Group, I'm going to try to wrap it up with a few you know, insights, takeaways um, that I think are universal. We can all sort of apply to our careers. Uh, regardless of which sector you're, you're interested in. So let's dive in. Uh, I grew up in Texas. Uh, I went to University of Texas at Austin for my undergrad. Uh, after spending a year in the College of Communications thinking that I was going to be a film director, I uh, transferred to the uh, School of Architecture and got my five-year degree, Bachelor of Architecture. Um, it was a really great education. Uh, it solidified my interest in uh, buildings, my passion, gave me a really solid foundation. It also kicked my tail. So I uh, started working for a firm right after school, but then kind of did that process of trying to figure out if the traditional field of architecture was really right for me. Um, and then the economy went to hell. And so the firm that I was working for had to do some adapting to, you know, we were working on residential infill in Austin projects trying to figure out how we navigate the landscape, and I was started to sort of apply that to myself. How can I adapt uh, and change? And so I ended up applying uh, to AmeriCorps and did a year of service uh, with Habitat for Humanity International in their uh, Atlanta office. Uh, I focused on neighborhood revitalization initiative, which was Habitat's way of adapting to say, uh, we have this existing building stock, let's weatherize it, uh, rehab it for low-income families. Um, after my year of service, I decided to take my new skills and experience and sort of appreciation uh, for getting into sustainability and energy efficiency, moved to New York. Um, I didn't get into the field right away, but I got, I, my first job was working for a construction firm, uh, which was a really great way to begin uh, to learn the industry. Since I didn't have, you know, my passion being uh, met in my nine to five at the time, I started to supplement by getting involved um, and doing events with areas of interest, uh, including Green Home NYC. Um, then I sort of had my big break. Uh, I actually attended a Green Home NYC Green Careers event, met a man by the name of Stephen Winter uh, with a little nudge uh, from mentors, ended up submitting my resume, applied for a job, did the interview uh, and got uh, a position at Stephen Winter Associates. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Stephen Winter Associates is an energy efficiency, sustainability, and accessibility consulting firm. In a nutshell, uh, we seek to improve the built environment and like to support high performance buildings. I specifically work in the sustainable housing 
uh, services department. Uh, that means I, I particularly focus on multifamily new construction projects. Uh, similar to Andrea, I work on a lot of projects that pursue various different performance um, and sustainability uh, programs. Um, and yes, that's what I do. Uh, a day in the life of uh, my job. The nice thing about my position is that one day is never the same. Um, it really uh, appeals to me and I like having that variety. Um, and I get to pull on my previous skills and experience in different ways every day. Um, so part of that, you know, when I get pulled onto a project, uh, it's usually during the design phase. Uh, so getting to work with architects and engineers uh, on their design, doing design charrettes and plan reviews, and making sure that their designs are meeting the performance standards, energy metrics for whatever program that their building is pursuing. So I got to use my architecture background, which is really great. Uh, I also move into the construction phase, um, and we do site inspections, uh, trades trainings with uh, not only general contractors, but with all the different uh, subs that are on a project. Um, and we're basically there, you know, from when the big, in the beginning, when the building's going into the, the ground uh, to occupancy. Uh, part of that field work is also doing performance testing. We do a thing called uh, blower door testing, compartmentalization, which is sort of a bread and butter for a lot of the these energy efficiency programs. Uh, depending on the uh, mechanical or HVAC systems, we might also do duct tightness testing. And now we're getting into passive house, so building envelope testing. Uh, lessons learned. So again, um, this is sort of where I'm going to be a uh, bit of a motivational speaker, because it's one of those, um, I think it's a uh, really good to learn from where people are coming from. Uh, so my first takeaway uh, is be adaptable. So you're going to get curveballs in your career regardless of if you know exactly where you're going and exactly what you want to do. The key is to figure out how to adapt uh, to those changes. Um, and uh, I would say then, if and when you do encounter um, a curveball, understand that you're still moving forward. Uh, try to use it as a learning experience. Don't think of it as a step back. The people you meet, the experiences that you get, the skills that you develop, you can all, always use them and leverage them uh, for the future, for things that you're applying for uh, later. Um, and then a solid piece of advice that uh, we do often hear is build your network. I would also sort of add, build your network before you need it. Um, kind of hone and nurture those uh, relationships that you have and then if and when, I'll keep saying it, you encounter a curveball, then you'll have the mentors and colleagues there to support you that you can rely on then. Um, so thank you. There's my contact information. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Lucy for inviting me in. This is my first event. So um, I'm bringing the perspective of a, of a social entrepreneur. When I was 22, I, whoops, that went really fast. Maybe I leaned on something. When I was 22, I, um, I started an organization called Unicité. And here we are. I'm not 22 years. There, I, that was a couple years ago at the 20 years of Unicité. Unicité has, I don't, I'm not really touching anything. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stand back. Uh, anyway, I don't need the picture. Unicité um, is based in France. It is now in 50 cities. Thanks to the amazing work of my co-founders, um, it's become a national movement inspiring legislation for 250,000 young people to do a year of service in France. And, um, and so it's that experience uh, that, I, that led me to Green City Force, which is my current venture and my current passion. When I finished my 10 years with uh, Unicité, I find myself on the West Coast. Oh no, we're skipping all. All right, well, we'll skip over the story of, Unic of Green City Force, how it came to pass. Ay, ay, ay. And um, we will go with the flow, which has been a theme. Um, uh, so, anyway, Green City Force grew out of my work with Van Jones and people around the, the country for about four years developing a vision for a national clean energy core. Um, which could uh, make a big contribution towards building an inclusive green economy. And coming to New York uh, back in 2009, I founded Green City Force to make that vision real. Our focus at Green City Force um, 
is uh, on young people who live in public housing and on enlisting them through a year of service, um, which was mentioned through an AmeriCorps model to uh, address city sustainability goals. So we work within public housing where the needs are acute. Um, this is our program model, just to give you a sense of what we do. So Green City Force connects the dots between city sustainability goals and youth unemployment. Um, youth unemployment is very acute in NYCHA. It is, there are only 28% of young people 18 to 24 who are known to be working. That's NYCHA's own numbers. Um, and so what we do at Green City Force is we recruit young people who have a GED or high school diploma. We're just going to ignore this, and I'm just going to, you know, do it. I'm being, I'm being brief, so I promise I'll stay within the limit. Um, the, uh, the model basically is about uh, recruiting young people who live in public housing, mobilizing them on large-scale initiatives related to transforming the land, the practices around the buildings, making upgrades in the buildings as a platform to prepare young people for careers in the green economy. So we design our own initiatives. This is um, Love Where You Live, which we started over five years ago, which we built using the input of core members. Um, here we have Dean, Patina, and, and Martin, and they are um, doing outreach for Love Where You Live, which has reached now, I think, over uh, 10 or 15,000 residents in their homes with pre um, information about how they, uh, people can recycle in NYCHA, how they can uh, become more energy efficient. And it's really about the resident to resident model of enlisting young people who are close to the problems and who have the solutions and the insights, giving them the information and the platform to be able then to bring these practices to uh, people across all of public housing, which is for those, I'm sure everybody knows, but it's a city within a city. It's 500,000 people, and it is one of the biggest landowners. It's one of the largest, it's the largest multifamily complex in the, in the country. And so the opportunity to transform NYCHA while creating employment opportunities and, and career paths with young people in NYCHA is why I'm so passionate about this. We build large-scale urban farms. This is in Howard Houses in Brownsville. So um, that's before and after, and we just celebrated our second harvest fest there. Our farms produce over 12,000 uh, pounds of organic produce, which is then um, uh, distributed to NYCHA residents by core members and our partners through a swap for compost for, uh, for, um, for food exchange. So we're also getting people composting. These are our four farms. We actually just broke ground on a fifth one last week in forest houses in the Bronx. We have three in Brooklyn, one at Wagner Houses in East Harlem, uh, one in the Bronx, another one coming in Staten Island. It's a big endeavor. Um, so Love Where You Live is working on practices in the home and the farms are, are transforming the land. This is, um, here is Evelyn, hard at work doing, uh, doing composting. The whole point of Green City Force is, again, to create a platform. So here we have an example of core members are working in wind and weather. They're doing um, all sorts of things, building up a tremendous work ethic in the process. They work in teams. Um, they uh, learn about the life cycle of plants. This is Shantanese, who is, is uh, smelling the basil, which I have to say the produce is incredible, um, all organic. Um, so core members are learning skills, and they're learning alongside professionals along the way, and very passionate residents and others. So they're, they're part of a, a, an incredible transformation. Um, they're also learning uh, do, by doing. So here's Shantanese with, with Sean and Paul, and they actually you know, built, they were our team with supervision, but building the, the Wagner Houses farm. And so they're learning the construction skills in the field um, and, and hands-on. Um, so you see I'm caught up, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping pace. Um, they also then one day a week, we have Green City Academy, so we bring our core members together. We have inspirational speakers. I hope you will all come and be speakers because all of those presentations I'd like to share with the core members and staff. Um, this is Richie Torres, the amazing Richie Torres speaking to our core members during one Green City Academy. We have professionals come. The idea is, uh, is to step back and do some classroom training and inspiration. This is community meeting. We also have a uh, a practice of a weekly ritual of hope, healing, celebration, feedback. It's tremendous professional development to sit there and take feedback from your peers and to learn to give it as, as well. Um, so finally, they do uh, also get training, technical skills training, to prepare for an array of, of next steps into uh, career paths so that, and we work with partners on that, um, and so that by the time they reach graduation, which if we're on cue, graduation, um, and get to the end of the six or 10 months of service, then by that point, the core members have had, they are, they are full-time, they're earning a stipend. You know, they have also then gone through all of these different experiences in training, teamwork, ethic, et cetera, and then they're ready to, to launch into the future. So this is just a quick view of how we're working with alumni. 
So we situate the, the service core experience as part of a pathway. And so this is our, our current passion because we now have over 400 alumni. And um, so very passionate about working with the alumni on a long-term basis. This is our illuminators team in those bright, um, somewhat hideous shirts. And they are um, out doing, actually working as part of the energy performance contract in NYCHA. And so we're, we're um, setting the wage at $15 an hour or more ourselves. We've created a social enterprise. We're hiring back graduates so that we can actually get out and do the work um, within NYCHA, making sure that young people from NYCHA actually get the work and then get the experience. And then out of that, those teams, the social enterprise teams, we are then able to place uh, graduates in, in more, you know, jobs that demand a little more experience and skills. So very excited about that work. This is a recent panel that we had at our youth summit where just to show that we have graduates now working in really across all of, you know, solar, energy efficiency, composting, electrical, apprentice, Paul's an entrepreneur, um, Liza's in building maintenance and operations. So just to give you a sense of how uh, I'm very excited to say they're now all over the place. This is Paul who owns his own hydroponic farm. He was one of 12 people selected by Kimball Musk. Um, as part of the Square Roots um, incubator. And so he has a hydroponic farm in a, in a shipping container. And that's my current passion, is actually working with graduates and core members who have their own projects so that I can bring it full circle as an entrepreneur and, and share, share what I've learned. Phew. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so my name is Laura Tajima. I'm with um, actually the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really amazing to be in this crowd. I mean, we work with SWA and we work with Bright Power and actually work with like Green City Forest. So it's just an amazing group to be up here with. Um, so yeah, so my name is, is Laura Tajima, as I mentioned. Um, I, again, had more of one of those curly Q uh, tracks to actually get where I am today. And uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got there, what I do, what the Mayor's Office of Sustainability does, um, and also kind of really like what's next in terms of uh, work and myself. So where I started, um, worked in Japan for teaching English for a little over two years. Those are my brilliant students. I was uh, basically the only foreigner within an hour drive. I was in a tiny village in the, in the middle of the mountains. And I think that taught me a lot, um, got me you know, pretty confident in terms of you know, going in to places and, and just kind of holding my own. Um, and then I came back to New York City and I was the director of a program that actually, a citywide program that had an education um, program in, in public schools. And so this brought international university students into public schools to talk about their cultures. Um, so that was about you know 500 workshops and people from 80 different countries and I was kind of managing that whole thing. Um, and lessons I learned through this experience, I think that New York City is probably the number one experience I learned. I was in the South Bronx and then I was you know, in Bed-Stuy and then I was in Flatbush, and then I was in East, East uh, Village, and I really got to see uh, this amazing city um, in a lot of different perspectives and a lot through the public school lens. And um, I think that taught me so much um, about the diversity of the city. It also, of course, taught me a lot about sustainability. A lot of my programs that I was designing and curriculum that I was developing was about sustainability. So I got to see sustainability through all of these different kind of perspectives and lenses and see these really amazing innovative solutions in other countries, including um, New York City, and that's, a, of course, a CSO. Um, but I also learned that teaching really hard and I uh, my heart goes out and my um, they're amazing every teacher you should just give them a hug they're incredible it's so hard and uh, you know I was also really finding that this wasn't really passionate for me um, uh, after a while and I was really kind of looking towards making a shift and especially kind of you know building on the sustainability experience that I've been really interested in through the program so I got involved at Columbia University. I went to here for my master's of science in sustainability management. And while I was here, I got involved in basically anything I could that really kind of uh, amped my experience in um, uh, building science as well as like analysis. And I worked on steam traps and I was uh, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and eventually I ended up at uh, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, uh, which is an amazing uh, group of people that I enjoy working with, of course. Uh, Mayor's Office of Sustainability is split into buildings, transportation, waste, uh, energy supply. So I'm actually on the buildings team, which is the biggest team uh, because uh, it's the biggest portion of our greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gas emissions is kind of our main focus in um, our program. We have, or in our office, we have uh, the goal of an 80% reduction by 2050 um, in greenhouse 
greenhouse gas emissions, which is a lot. And, uh, and buildings, of course, is that main portion uh, that we have to reduce. It's two thirds of our um, greenhouse gases. These are some of our plans that we work on. And kind of, you know, this is one of our plan that kind of said, well, what will it take to get us to an 80% reduction by 2050? And um, really kind of looking at all the levers we needed to, to kind of pull to make it happen. And basically, the moral story is, it is technically possible to get to 80 by 50. What are the levers? You have to do everything. You have to do zero waste. You have to do deep retrofits across the city. You have to do, you know, 70% of renewables on, on the grid. Um, not only that, but, you know, with our 1.5 degree plan, which was just released, which basically looked at what is New York City's contribution to keep global, emission, global temperatures below 1.5 degrees, we have to do more sooner. So that means not only do we have to get to an 80% reduction, but we have to get started right now and we have to start bending that curve right now. So what do I do on a day-to-day? -day? I think I do spreadsheets a lot. Um, I can't even emphasize, and you engineers probably are like, oh, local ID7 and 84 are pain, but like, that is the crux of everything that we do, and it's incredibly important, and the data that we get from buildings really kind of drives everything that we do. Um, I also work on the Community Retrofit Program, which is our program that provides free advisory services to building owners to kind of scale up energy uh, retrofits in, uh, in the built environment and uh, work with Block Power, which is an incredibly intimate as our implementation contractor. Programs are really important for our work. Uh, we know this stuff is hard and we want to give kind of that support to people out in the field. What else do I do? I learn and listen. I'm surrounded by, I just try to surround myself by really smart people. This is an air source heat pump diagram, which our office is really, really interested in right now. It's a really efficient uh, heating mechanism. Uh, we are working with experts across the city, across the country, across the world, and trying to figure out what this means and how do we uh, scale implementation in New York City. So um, the other thing I do, of course, is work with partners. Uh, we set policy, and then you know our agencies are also often the ones that actually are implementing it. And we know that this is not their main mission. They have these other really important missions. So what do we have to do in terms of uh, supporting them, giving them resources, uh, you know, uh, uh, making sure that sustainability is uh, worked into what they do. And also what I do is, of course, think big. And that's what we all have to do is think big. This is a huge problem. And we literally need every single person to change how they're living, change how they're working, change their buildings in order to us to get to our goal. So we have to think big. We have to think about how this affects the whole city, from my students to you know the CEOs. Um, that, that's going to be really critical. So what's next? I think that you know in terms of the city, uh, our 1.5 plan really kind of sets out out what we're going to be doing, and it's going to be talking about doing our programs and, and in, increasing those in terms of voluntary action, but that's not going to take everything, and we're going to have to have mandates, and we're going to have to have requirements, and figuring out what we have to put into place in order to kind of uh, support the equity as aspects as well, too, um, and, and, and make sure that we're, you know, the impacts are, are just and even. Um, what also is next? They kind of cheated. This is my second slide. What else is next for me? Um, I think that you know, thinking about a woman in green career, green careers in general, I think is pretty amazing because we don't know what's next. We don't know how to get to 80 by 50, even though we have all these great plans. Um, and so you know, it really provides this flexibility and this freedom to kind of really figure out where I go next. You know, how can I, uh, you know take this new idea, this new project, you know, really kind of learn it, get involved, and, and kind of take it to the next place. So um, I think that Green Careers is kind of a, a very interesting place to, to be in and uh, provides a lot of flexibility and empowerment to go forward. Wow, that was amazing, guys. <laughs> guys, I know, I know, women. It's actually women. <laughs> it's closer. Um, all right, just another round of applause for all of our amazing speakers tonight. Um, really great job with everyone. I know our timing was slow and then fast and slow and fast, and you got women are really good at this. So, sorry, it's a colloquial term. Okay. So anyway, I want to bring all of our speakers up. Uh, you guys can... S oh, sorry, man. All of our terms are male. Did you realize that? Man. You guys. All right, thanks. Uh, I want to put this up. Um, all right. I have some extra mics. Um, so if anyone wants to start, if anyone has any questions for our speakers, I can pass the mic to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> All 
Okay, I'll start. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Say your name. Okay, my name is Ifan. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm from uh, SIPA MPA DP program. My question is about waste, actually. Um, New York City has a plan for re uh, completely reducing uh, landfill to zero by 2030, if I remember it correctly. So I'm wondering um, what's your take on what's a crucial part in realizing this? This ambitious go, yeah. Because we we all know like New York City produces like is one of the cities that produce most waste in the world. So that's really ambitious plan. Okay, thank you. Any specific person. Or? Um, or, okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. The trash person. <laughs> Just don't hold the bottom of the mic, she said. Yeah. Can you hear this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. There it is. All right. So um, New York, j just a little refresh for everybody. New York has a plan called Zero Waste by 2030, and the goal is to send, it's actually a 90% reduction in waste to landfill uh, by 2030, which means that we have to recycle the rest, so we're, it's really a diversion goal to recycle and hopefully, ideally, reduce waste. So we, it's a big order, but the way to get there is to change consumption culture so that we're doing more of the sharing, swapping, borrowing, donating, gifting, and otherwise reducing waste, as well as um, it's a total shift in the economy. We really have to create a zero waste economy, so we have to create an economy that where our businesses are using materials again and again, uh, that we have more zero waste economy jobs, more in the reuse sector, for example, and it goes on and on. So it's a, it's a major shift. And I, I hopeful we will get there by 2030. Using a different so, uh, I'm a buildings person, but I am at the mayor's office of sustainability. And yeah, zero waste is definitely one of our, you know, we like ambitious uh, goals, but they're, they're critical goals. They are completely critical goals in order to keep us, um, you know, avoiding the worst impacts of, of climate change. So yeah, I think that that is exactly it. It's, it's talking about recycling. It's talking about organics, and we're looking forward to continuing to expand organic um, uh, program, um, but also it's all about uh, reducing consumption. And one thing that I think that you know is, is an exciting thing that we always work on that you guys can't always get involved in is our Green YC campaign. And our Green YC campaign um, really tries to impact kind of consumer cultures to kind of uh, make people aware of both uh, bringing water bottles, bringing coffee mugs, um, using reusable bags uh, to to um, get people to kind of reduce those uh, disposable items. Um, but at the same time, I think, as I said before, I think voluntary action will only get us so far. Um, and I think that, you know, we really have to think about, you know, what is really going to make sure that we uh, kind of ramp up, uh, you know, this, uh, what we need to do in order to get to these goals. Because I, I, I do think that, you know, we recognize that they are ambitious goals. Andrea. Wow, this is a loud mic. Earlier you said that um, one of the problems you have on site is guys calling you sweetie and honey and baby and all that. And I have a friend of mine in the construction industry who solved the problem by referring to all men on the construction site as kitten. <laughs> and she found it to be very effective. And I want to ask all of you, or a few of you, what is your trick to stop that in the field? Yeah, um, well, uh, honestly, I, I, I did say that um, I have called them things back, and actually that has been really weirdly effective because they're, like, taken back and, like, don't know what to say and are just kind of have, like, deer in the headlights kind of look. Um, I have not figured out how to stop it, per se, but I will say that kind of... Um, being just sort of like not looking like you're being too offended, um, 
being very like if it if it's something stupid like that, I'll usually sass them back because that's kind of like the the thing on the site is to kind of like you know uh, play around. Um, but I think that in general, um, I'm still I'm still learning about that and uh, and you know giving it right back shows that you're um, you know that that you're not afraid of uh, of what they're doing. But um, that's kind of it really. I'll jump in. Um, Andrew, you had an anecdote as well of, of somebody, you know, having a discussion and not really get, getting met in the eye, no eye contact, talking to the gentleman next to you. I've had that before as well. And I think there's not only sort of a, a gender thing, but then there's also an age when you're on construction sites and you're, they're like, oh, who's this young kid who's now telling me how to do my job? I've been doing it this way for X amount of years, yada, yada, yada. And I, I feel like one of the strategies that I've tried to use is if you try to engage in a conversation, if people, if they feel like you're telling them what to do, you can ask questions, engage to see, well, what would you do instead? Or this is a problem, how would you do it? How would you, um, how would you solve this problem? And then it becomes more of a dialogue and then they're able to step up and give their input um, and you sort of take that pressure off of, um, yeah, making them feel like you're challenging them or, um, yeah, critiquing their work. And so I've found that to be sort of a strategy. And if you try to emphasize as well, like, hey, we're all working on the same project together. We're all trying to get, I'm not trying to, you know, impede your job. We're working on the same thing. Let's try to work it together. But I'm definitely going to call men kittens if I <laughs> encounter that again. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks for your presentations. They were really enjoyable. Uh, my name is Mina Agarabi, and there is a new term out called manspeating, I believe. Yes. Instead of mansplaining, oh. it's now manspeating. So basically what it is is, uh, and I've been in this situation a number of times, um, as I also run my own business, and I'll be in a meeting and I'll share an idea or I'll raise a point and it sort of just kind of flies over everybody's heads. And then about 25 minutes later, the, uh, a male person will speak up and say something pretty much to the same effect. And everybody jumps like, oh, that's awesome. We should do this. And, and you're just like, and, and so I'm just curious um, what how do you approach those situations, and um, what advice do you have for your peers? Thanks. Yeah, I think we've all been there. Um, I don't know if personally I've been able to use this um, so far, but one thing I've heard is um, I think it started in the White House. Um, this was happening in meetings there, and one thing that women were doing was um, so if you said something, they would say, so another woman in the room would repeat it and say, echo it. Say, oh, you know, th that was a great idea Mia just had and sort of reinforced that, yes, you just said that. Um, that was something that attributes to you. Um, so just kind of supporting your fellow women in the room and making sure, echoing that and making sure that everyone heard that you said that, that's where it came from and kind of endorsing it, um, assuming it's a good idea. <laughs> so that's, I haven't done it myself, but I've heard that, um, that's something that can work. And um, I think that idea works really well where you have, when you have teammates that are already there and that are there to support you, but sometimes you're by yourself and and you're, you know, this exact in this exact situation, what I would say is, oh, that sounds very similar to that idea that I was putting out there previously, but I'm not sure how yours is different. <laughs> or, um, or, you know, maybe yours is, is slightly different, but mine maybe was better. Um, so maybe not with that tone, but at least the, this is very similar to what I was saying earlier, and maybe you didn't hear it, but this is where I was coming from. Or, you know, just, you can put it out there that that's something that you already said. And sometimes it's with a client, and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, but if it's with a client, you want to show them that that came from you in the first place, right? You're showing your value, and I think if it's in a, res you know, 
a responsible adult tone, it can go pretty well. It doesn't need to be a super aggressive thing to say. And just remind everyone that, you know, it's not the first time that idea was put out there. I think there was another. <laughs> I think I saw you before. <laughs> Question, right? All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Mia Feldman. And I'm wondering if any of you have ever had a dilemma in your career where maybe it was difficult to choose the more environmentally responsible course of action. And if so, could you tell us a little bit about that? You're also pious. <laughs> Hi. This actually speaks to a job that I didn't even mention. <laughs> But I used to work at a um, Voltaic Systems. This is a solar backpack company. They do portable solar um, bags and devices. And um, we used to have to manufacture all of our parts of the bag in China. Uh, we really tried to manufacture it here in the US, but every single thing that we did was not possible. So we worked, it was a very small team of people, but we had to work together to find out the solution to make the bag more environmentally responsible as, long as, as well as solar panels and everything included. So we didn't always make the number one most environmentally responsible decision. However, we weighed them all across so that we picked uh, actually a, a warehouse or a factory in China that we went to visit. I didn't personally go, but my, my the owners of the company went to visit and they worked very closely with them and they made sure that they were paid well. They made sure that they had good working conditions and they made sure that the, all of the, the bag was made from all recycled wares and they made double checked on all of those things and numerous other things went into that. So it was a very challenging thing, but um, they were able to make relatively good, you know, high highbrow decisions um, upon being environmentally sound. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but you know, it's just one example. Anybody else? Uh, that that type of thing happens often in uh, in in consulting on new construction or existing building jobs. Um, you you have a lot of different players in the game that have a lot of different priorities. And so obviously for us, we wanna make sure that everything in the building is as energy efficient and as sustainable as possible. Um, but maybe it's cost, maybe it's safety, maybe it's um, accessibility, maybe it's something else that, that is a priority to someone else that you kind of have to um, compromise. And so I, I think the big thing is to understand that there are multiple different types of needs and priorities on a given project and to try to work to meet that and to make it very clear that you are sort of maybe compromising in a certain place but you want to make up for it elsewhere and it's just a, a struggle continuously. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I'm Yue Chi from CIP as well. Uh, I'm also concentrated on energy, especially renewable energy. So I have my specific question because you mentioned China, because I'm from China. <laughs> and also recently, the, the uh, crystalline silicon material, the petition, like 201 petition regarding like the importing from China, there's a big issues happening. I'm just wondering if, uh, I think a couple of you guys working on the, actually install the, how to say, the installation in terms of like the real, you guys, the, the buyer for, from the Chinese like, supplier side. I wonder how this petition gonna affect your day-to-day -day job or business operation and also like the profit and margin in that way. Uh, and especially, especially like thin film like PV versus like silicon PV. How's the market now f as you as a procurement, how would you value that part? Um, I'll take that one, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, and I, I actually, I was going to say for the previous question that sometimes it's challenging even for, or for us when we build clean energy systems, it's, um, there's always this question of where do the materials come from? Do they come from across the world? And our answer is, well, the most cost effective option for you is to go with a product that comes from Asia. Um, and even though, yes, it's not, 
you know, a product that was sourced from the local economy, made in the US with a small carbon footprint, that is the product that will allow the US economy, the, the solar industry to really thrive and install more and more and more solar. So that's one of the challenges that the solar industry has faced in the past on the, on the environmental um, question. Um, and yeah, the, the trade case on solar may have a huge impact on the solar industry. Um, it's already causing a lot of um, instability when we're buying panels. There's a lot of unknowns as to whether the president is going to sign a very strong tariffs on solar panels. So um, prices have already gone up significantly and and uh, there's a lot of lobbying going on to make sure that the tariff or whatever um, whatever resolution comes out is going to have a limited impact on the industry, uh, but it is already affecting us very significantly, especially on projects that are already signed. Um, so lobby for solar. Um, <laughs> I think it, it, everyone is just scared because the, the, the president is very hard to predict and um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so that's why everyone is kind of freaking out about it. But we will know soon. So maybe uh, maybe we're all out of jobs in 2018. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> no, the plan is not to. And I think we'll adapt to it, but it will definitely affect us. So. Hi. Um, yeah, I read of some research recently about the job search process, and uh, I was reminded I, a woman I know called me recently, and she was looking, thinking about applying for a job, and the, the job description, like there were three things you had to have, A, B, and C. And she had A, and she had most of B and some of C, and she said, well, there's no point in me even applying for the job because I don't have all the qualifications. And it reminded me of this research said that, that you, you know, uh, I, I encourage her to apply for the job. You know, that men are, for better or for worse, are more likely to say, well, you know, listen, I'll get into the interview and I'll wing it, <laughs> you know, but I'm gonna submit my resume, whereas women will be more reluctant to even submit a resume because, well, it says I have to have five years of experience in this and I've only got three, so I can't even submit my resume. So I guess I always encourage, you know, be more like men and just, Bullshit, but, you're, when you, when you, but it was interesting just that uh, not applying for jobs, all the jobs that, that uh, women could possibly apply for. I actually heard at a women's conference that a good way to get around that issue is to put on job descriptions something like candidates with 70% of these skills will be considered for the position or having a language that's a little more, we'll consider you if you're like close enough. Um, with, and that is proven to encourage more women to apply to those positions. So it's something that everyone should do, and it's literally one sentence on the job description. But a lot of employers aren't going to do that, so yeah. I think, I think mm -hmm. well, until they do, I think it's uh, true. Go for it. I don't know. I kind of feel like everybody on this panel wouldn't do that because <laughs> I know I've never done that. If there's a job description, and I've had quite a few jobs. And if I'm not completely qualified in one area, I go to I try and get the interview and I try to wing it. And I do encourage everybody to do that because, you know, sometimes you interview well and sometimes you have better resume skills, but really brush up on those interview skills, get conversation lists, find out about your potential interviewer, definitely know about the company and just Try to get in there. If they want more sales skills, figure out what those might be. Talk them up. There's definitely ways around that. And I think an important thing to keep in mind is that uh, a list of job requirements is really like an ideal. And I don't think j employers really think they're going to get everyone, you know, a person who can do all of the above. You know, I'm sure a lot of you know about the, the new Nobel Prize laureate for economics. And he's really spent his entire career showing how consumer behavior is really irrational. And I think that happens with recruiters too. So a lot of times, and I know I've hired people over, t over time, they did, I always I like overlooked things that they didn't have because I just liked them. 
you know, and there was really good chemistry and I maybe just rationalized it in my head saying, oh, I'll teach this person these, other, these skills when they get here. I just want somebody really good, hardworking, who's pleasant to work with and et cetera, et cetera. So give yourself a chance by just going to the interview. Amen. <laughs> so first I just wanted to say thank you for all of the people on the panel. Um, I was really inspired by some of your stories and like your very non-traditional paths. And um, you know, I, it, it really taught me a lot. But I think that the question that I want to ask is related to what I have noticed, which is that in the sustainability or green careers or environmental field, there is a lack of cultural diversity. Um, we definitely need diversity in terms of like the female to male ratio. And I, I, that's why I applaud the fact that you're on here. It's important to have women, but it's important to have people uh, as well in this field from other cultures as well. There are a few, I'm not saying there aren't, but you know, what are, and that's why I kind of really enjoyed, you know, your project on Green City Force and what you're doing, kind of how you're saying how, seeing how some of the people that are trained are able to also open up kind of their own business and their own initiatives and br really bring things to you know a, a full circle. But I'm more interested in knowing what are some of these other um, companies doing, not only to attract, but I think the most important thing, retain people you know of, of color, people of uh, other cultures, um, because I, I definitely am kind of an idealist in the sense that I believe that you need uh, people from wide variety that have a wide variety of different viewpoints in order to meet some of these sustainability goals, and it's really important to tap into, you know, certain um, cultural groups that you know have a ton of potential that maybe are not able to get some of the opportunities um, that other people have. I mean, some of you have an art background, for example, and you were able to, you know, be able to switch and do a, a green career, but you know maybe someone from a different culture, it might not be that easy to move from art to do solar panels or something like that, you know? So I guess my question is, just to shorten this. Um, <laughs> More like it. Uh, just to shorten this, wh what are some of these uh, companies doing to re attract and retain minorities? What are the initiatives? Because right now, uh, it's very monochromatic so one of the things that um, I'll sort of jump in and say and try to tap into that a little bit. Um, so one of the programs that I entered when I first got to New York uh, was through an organization called Non-Traditional Employment for Women, uh, new, and they had a renew program, which was construction. It was basically a pre-apprenticeship -apprentice uh, training program. Um, for women interested in entering the trades. And I bring this up because there were partner organizations, um, Solar One, um, AEA, uh, which is Association of Energy Affordability. Um, so there are a lot of nonprofits and programs that are out there for helping to say, you know, okay, um, were you formerly incarcerated? Are you a woman? Are you an emerging professional that doesn't have, say, the opportunity to get the practical experience that could make you, uh, could set you apart for applicants that are applying for jobs? So I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily point to a particular organization or a particular track, but I know, well, I can point to particular organizations that are trying to bolster um, demographics that are underrepresented uh, in our industry and try to promote training. We talked about that as one way to really, you know, bolster yourself and as a really good way to set yourself apart. So there are strategies, organizations, training programs that can try to help build the skills so that we can get uh, more emerging and transitioning professionals the skills to set themselves apart. Um, so I would say, you know, sort of encourage looking at um, different programs and, and NYSERDA is a really good resource for looking for, for training and education and maybe there needs to be more outreach um, to make sure that we're all aware of those different training programs um, but there are resources out there trying to make a shift in that direction. I think. Yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can hear, can, there we go. 
So this is my passion. I mean, this is why we created Green City Forests, because uh, there is an absolute need to diversify the entire sustainability sector, and not because it's nice to do it, but because we absolutely need the talent to be able to meet these big challenges that you mentioned that we're trying to meet in our city and in the world. And I can say that there are specific companies we work with. So at Green City Force, we uh, do training, and we um, also follow through with graduates. So we're training, but we're also following through. And because it's all about uh, not just training, but then the job, and then what comes next, and building career paths and building towards ownership, ultimately. And so I think that just concretely, there are companies that are dedicated to this. And um, if I were looking for a job, I would... I would absolutely look at what is the culture of the organization. Are they working towards these goals? At Green City Force, now over eight years, we work with employers that are very uh, varied. Sometimes our graduates are the only people of color, and so it's you know a totally different ball game from joining a crew or a situation where your supervisor uh, might be of color, or you can see that career path in somebody um, you can relate to from that perspective. So. It's just, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of um, practices out there, and some companies are being more effective than others, and I think it's an absolutely competitive edge that companies are now having to, having to address. So. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone again. We are out of time for questions. Sorry. Um, just a quick round of applause again for our speakers. All right, uh, so thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, there is an after party, <laughs> uh, and it is really important that you guys come out because as you have learned from these women, you know, Green Home NYC has helped them find their careers, and you might meet someone tonight that can get you to that next step, or you might find your next mentor. So uh, we re really encourage everyone to come out. Uh, the bar is so close to here, so you won't get lost. Um, <laughs> And um, if you have any questions for the, these speakers, you know, I'm hoping they're going to join us, or so, some of them will be joining us, so you can ask those questions uh, at the bar as well. Um, and we thank everyone again for coming out tonight, uh, and we'll hope to see you at the next one. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>